So, welcome to another Mormon Truth video. Not even sure if this is going to be on the Mormon Truth or on the Dodger Game channel, but uh, I'm going to be looking into why people believe in Mormonism and or Christianity or other Christian type religions. What is it and why, why do, what do they believe and why do they stay in? Especially when they find things that really don't go with the doctrine, the dogma, and so forth. Here I'm looking at John Dolan and his wife. Uh, they're doing an interview of uh, several Mormon ladies. A couple, or maybe all, of which maybe have some reputation uh, for not being maybe what you'd call uh, your typical uh, falling in line with the dogma uh, members of the church. So maybe they're considered progressive or rebels or borderline apostate depending on how you look at things and if we look at Mormon doctrine we see that these brethren at the top say they speak with and for God and either you're all in or you're all out and uh, I'm kind of quoting uh, Brian Keith Dalton on a uh, video he did which I have done some portions of here because I think is really good. I mean, I've done on the channel, not necessarily in this. Maybe I will. So, they're talking to uh, a couple girls named Jana and Carolyn Pearson we spotted in there for a moment. She's kind of a famous LDS author. Not This is a Jana. Okay, uncovering what LDS Inc. has been covering up. So, uh, there's some provocative you know, a discussion going on here with these gals, and they are telling us their, their take on things. And I'd like to interject some thoughts. Welcome back, Jan Reese. It's a delight to have you as always. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And it's so great to not be the only Jana. So this <laughs> is you. Yeah, we've got the Janas today. Jana Spangler. Welcome for the first time to Mormon Stories. It's great to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. So tell us just a bit about yourself. Um, okay, so I was born and raised in the church. Um, and I would say that my upbringing wasn't terribly strict, but it was, it was very consistent. Um, and I probably um, started kind of questioning things um, you know, probably over the last three and a half years and three years ago, I had a pretty hard shelf crash. <laughs> so I've been dealing with things since then, um, trying to, uh, figure out what my path is and it, it changes regularly. Um, this is definitely not a path you stay still on. So what I say today and how I feel today could be different a month from now. Um, but I, um, so I'm a, I'm a life coach with Symmetry Solutions. Um, and I'm really enjoying my work there. Um, and I don't know what else. All right. That's what's being received. Let's jump into this interview. Let's go back around the horn and have each of you briefly discuss what was it that made your faith become maybe more complex? And it's, you know, bound groups of dialogue issues and reading them. And that was, for me, one of the most formative introductions to the faith, because I had had a conversion experience to the Book of Mormon. I had had a conversion experience to several key aspects of Mormon theology, but it was very important for me if I was going to be changing my life in this really molecular way to know that I was not going to be required to check my brain at the door and that I would be in a company, a fellowship of other thinking and believing people. What um, I would say just a deep spiritual connection to these people and a, and a deep truth in what I was hearing. And I, I, it was so much more influential to me than what was happening at church. And at, at some point I started going, why, why is, why am I not getting that same fulfillment as I listen to general conference why is this not filling me in the same way if we have the truth why is why is it not 
feeling right to me. And it was really confusing. And in the midst of that, I think I was just having a hard time. I was feeling a little depressed, um, reaching out to God, trying to feel like, cause that's where I'm supposed to go to get comfort is God. And yet I'm not feeling him and started questioning if I'd ever felt him and started questioning everything. And, and the first time I opened my mouth to a few people that I knew to discuss that, those dis- conversations did not go well. And uh, as, as, very faithful people that I looked up to spoke to me and could not even make an allowance for the experience I was going through. I think in that moment is when my shelf crashed and I thought something is wrong with this when I can't be honest and have that be honored. And so um, I think almost overnight, I went from thinking I knew everything (laughs) to feeling like I knew nothing. (laughs) And um, it was very disorienting and I, I really relate to what Carolyn said about picking up the pieces. I feel like that has been my process. Um, When I read Ghost of Eternal Polygamy, that really resonated with me because I feel like that's what I've done. And I was just determined not to pick up anything that I didn't really authentically connect to. So I've been on that journey ever since. Carolyn Pearson, (laughs) um, do you have a label that you use to describe your your type? to be much more comfortable in that someday. Um, I, I So often, I don't even know what to say when people ask. Um, you know, at the core of it, yes, of course I'm Mormon. Um, but I do, I guess I do feel like certain assumptions are made of me just given that label. And so I, I do feel like I want to qualify that in some way. Um, and I know... Um, But, you know, it really just depends on who I'm speaking to and how much they know about it. And, you know, it's actually sparked a lot of really interesting conversations with people when I do start to kind of qualify it a little bit. Then we can go a little deeper and they'll ask questions. And it's it's led to some really good conversation. So John DeLenn's really been investigating uh, ramifications of... uh, how people are affected by by the way that the church leadership approaches people who have a trouble, a difficult time saying, we believe, uh, checking their brains at the door or their personal identity, their, their autonomy, their individuality, because it is uh, follow the brethren, it's, you know, their way or the highway, really. Um, somehow these gals have managed to stay in the church a lot of people have been excommunicated so maybe they've been rather rather careful with what they said Uh, this Jana we're looking at right now expressed uh, in the interview a little bit about uh, how her faith challenges sounds to me like got her really looked down upon because for the assumption is is that you must have you must have sinned in order to have some sort of, of, of question or loss of faith. You must have implicit faith in the brethren, and faith is a gift from God as a result of personal righteousness, is what Bruce McConkie, the apostle, taught. And so, basically, <laughs> you see how the circular reasoning works there as far as uh, basically mind control? Yeah, if you get out of line with the brethren, if you disagree with anything, well, it's because, you know, you must have sinned, so you've lost light and truth. Light and truth, the destroyer taketh away light and truth through disobedience and through the traditions of the fathers. That's Doctrine and Covenants section 93. And so, the history of the church is really problematic since... A lot of it's been rewritten and covered up, especially with regard to Joseph Smith's relationships with many women, which was later kind of covered under the uh, Brigham Young polygamy thing, but Joseph Smith was not a polygamist. There were a lot of ladies in his life, life, but he was not married to them. And, uh, you know, the Book of Abraham being a complete fraud, and really the Book of Mormon... (laughs) Uh, filled with anachronisms and an obvious 19th century production 
uh, to many people who can see the the 19th century aspects of it and you know the New Testament arguments and the New Testament language and quotes and so forth during you know the Old Testament times hundreds and hundreds of years before you know anyone was talking about these things much less speaking Greek which didn't exist so all uh, these things you know Joseph Smith using the magic stone in the hat to seek for treasure and all sorts of things doing you know ne necromantic arts he was a magician and uh, continued to use the stone in conjunction with the so-called translation of the plates which weren't even there according to his father-in-law his wife Emma and David Widmer so we didn't why don't we see these things in Sunday school <laughs> Well, they don't sound too good, apparently, so we just rewrite the truth. But since uh, enough of this has come to surface, the church has shown the seer stone, gotten it out, dug it out of the first presidency vault, and put a picture of it on LDS.org. And, you know, got, I'm not really going to get into gospel topics essays on this video, but uh, basically... The premise that the church is founded upon is that Jesus Christ came down, visited Joseph Smith, uh, brought his dad with him to introduce him, and uh, started a new dispensation of the gospel, restoring all things, and made Joseph Smith basically the new American Pope, you know, uh, taking over for the Roman Church being the new broker for heaven, for for you know, for the kingdom of God, the vicar, vicar of God, your go-between, your mediator between you and heaven, is the LDS Church, and if you don't listen, then you're kicked out, and your loved ones are told to stay the heck away from you because you are an infection of apostasy. So shunning is a big thing. Can't get a temple recommend if you sympathize with people who are not in agreement with <clears throat> the prophets, the current day prophets, <laughs> because old prophets, well, they just fade into uh, history and are deemed as having made ridiculous theories influenced by the men of their day when we want to, when, when the brethren want to change doctrine. So. These gals are recounting some of their experiences with that, with John, who's very into how people's lives are affected by the policies of the brethren. I guess I, that, that sounds like a fair assessment. And uh, anyway, let's move along. This way I see it, Christianity and Mormonism basically give us some sort of an outline to believe how we got on this planet and they sell us an importance of joining their particular brand of religion in order to be happy in the hereafter and Christianity generally seems to be saying that if you join our church if you are you know, if you do what we say, like be baptized or or accept Jesus or depending on the particular faith, then you will be acceptable to God. Doesn't matter that much what you've done in your life. And you get to live with God and be really happy. So maybe you're playing a harp on a cloud or something. I don't know. And if you don't join our church, you're going to burn in hell with the devil and his angels for all eternity. And this is our loving Heavenly Father, who determines our, you know, our state in the hereafter based on whether or not we joined the right organization. That doesn't really go along well with what the New Testament says that Jesus taught, as far as treating your fellow beings being very important. When he, he said, you know, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, unto me will, you know, come into the kingdom. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. So Mormonism has taken the stand that the, that Joseph Smith was 
appointed by God to restore an ancient religion which encompasses all truth and provides all things necessary in truth and ordinances, etc., in priesthood authority, to bring one back into the presence of God, having accomplished your earthly mission to gain a physical body, learn how to control your body and your mind, and subject your will to that of Jesus Christ through the ministration of the Holy Spirit so that you are progressing and becoming like God and eventually becoming a God or a goddess depending on if you are a guy or a girl. Now we've also noticed that this has been de-emphasized in recent years as the Mormon leadership want to appear to be more and more like evangelical Christians and just another denomination of Christianity. At any rate, what we have learned is that they say they speak to and for God and that we better listen or we're going to burn in hell. Although the whole hell thing has been kind of de-emphasized as well, notwithstanding it's preached very heavily in the Book of Mormon, which is supposed to contain the fullness of the gospel, although most of what Mormons are known for is not contained in the Book of Mormon. It is contained in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, which used to actually have doctrine in it from the lectures on faith, thus contributing to the name Doctrine and Covenants, but they dropped the doctrinal teachings from the lectures on faith from Joseph Smith given in the School of the Prophets, and just left what we have now. Additionally, much of it came from the Book of Commandments, and some of those revelations were very radically changed when they went into the Book of Mormon, telling us that Jesus really didn't say what they said he said. He said something different, and we got it wrong the first time in a whole bunch of those revelations. So this and many other things in the LDS canon of scripture and its history don't seem to go along very well with the assertion that a perfect, loving, omniscient, that means for you non-Latin speakers, not that I'm a Latin speaker anyway, all-knowing, and unchanging God guides the church. So LDS theology seems to be a lot more sensible to most people, in the church at least, than Christianity because it doesn't automatically send everybody to hell forever who just didn't know about Jesus and accept him into their lives. Unfortunately, it seems like most Western religion is geared not upon the way you treat your fellow person, but what company you join. What company store? You're, are you Lutheran? Are you, are you, you know, Protestant in, in some other way? Are you Catholic? Are you Mormon? Scientologist? SDA? Jehovah's Witness? If so, the Christians say you're going to burn in hell. So you could be an honest and good person trying to do your very best, but you're going to burn in hell because you joined the wrong church out of maybe a thousand Christian denominations. Does that make sense to you? What kind of a God would do that? Why are we really here and what's it all about? Well, religion is supposed to solve the why are we here business, and it doesn't always do a great job, and then reward us if we obey the company that we join, the church, the business that we join, the 501c3 corporation that we join that says they are the broker of God's graces unto us. Does this really make sense? Have you asked yourself these types of questions? There are going to be some questions asked of these gals here that I think, you know, bring, bring some of these thoughts to mind. Because the minute we say we believe, we've given up our individuality, our autonomy, and we've given into groupthink. And is this truly coming from the creator of earth and of our souls and of our bodies? Is it? Do we cling to some of these beliefs because they're comfortable? The more we get into theology, the more we see many contradictions, things that just don't make sense, things that obviously don't have a divine origin because they are not based in truth if they contradict each other. Just as we see throughout the canon of LDS scripture, notwithstanding on 
not even mentioning anachronisms yet, but just in doctrinal issues, there are so many things that just don't add up once you really think about it. Was God once a man? Was he the son of another God and another God and another God, like Joseph Smith taught in the King Follett Discourse? Or did he create all things through Jesus Christ, like it says in Hebrews and in Ephesians in the New Testament? This, these are reasons why Christians say, well, you don't believe in the same God or Jesus and have all their issues with Mormons because they, in their vitriolic hatred sometimes, sound like Islamic fundamentalist extremists that feel that it's fine just to go out and send everyone to hell who doesn't believe what they believe. But then again, isn't that what Judaism was based on in the Old Testament? Isn't that what Yahweh did? Just go and have his people massacre everyone who believed something different from them? Well, maybe not everyone. Sometimes it doesn't seem to really make sense as to why they spared some Canaanite tribes and massacred others, or massacred even other Semite tribes such as the Midianites, Moses' in-laws, basically. I don't suppose he killed his father-in-law or mother-in-law. He got the priesthood, supposedly, from his father-in-law. But the rest of their relatives, I sub it sounds like he had massacred. And then, of course, the human sacrifice that was involved with the virgins that weren't given to the soldiers or the other men. They killed all the mothers and the boys after they'd killed the dads. This is what Yahweh ordered, apparently. Really great guy. Where do you sign up for Christianity, which seems to be based upon Judaism, but Jesus Christ somehow gets blended into this Yahweh figure as a nicer guy. He's apparently gone through some sort of anger management training in his pre-mortal excursion. His pre, pre, yeah, in his pre-mortal life before his mortal excursion here, depending on how you view God, if you're involved with that Christian Trinity business, Judaism or Mormonism, or any of the similar Christ-based religions, they all seem to focus on, follow our company and you'll be blessed, go somewhere else and you're going to burn in hell. The Book of Mormon clearly teaches that anyone who teaches false doctrine is going to burn in hell. So that means if Mormonism is true and you're preaching you know, Presbyterianism, Methodism, Lutheranism, you're going to burn in hell. And for damn sure, if you're Catholic. Of course, there's a lot of nice people in every faith, even though none of them really make sense once you really get into the doctrine and think about it. I mean, was the earth made in six days? In Mormonism, I guess we go to six creative periods, but was Adam really the first flesh on earth, the first man also, as it says, like in the book of Moses, Joseph Smith's translation of Genesis? And did death really enter the earth only at the fall of Adam 6,000 years ago, as it says in the book of Mormon? It doesn't look like this goes too well with science. And of course, Mormonism is built upon the back of Christianity. And Joseph Smith's translation of the book of Moses books of Moses, but the book of Moses, you know, it put in the Pearl of Great Price, about eight chapters, confirms the whole Genesis narrative with regard to the creation, the fall of man, and the flood of Noah, that apparently didn't kill the Native Americans that have been on the American continents for, who knows, maybe 15,000 years, obviously long before Adam and Eve got their first fig leaves when they were about to leave the garden. Fortunately, the Lord slaughtered some animals and initiated the killing there, quick-dried some skins, and made them garments. After that, of course, that's only 6,000 years ago, they should have had all of their descendants, except eight, be slaughtered in Yahweh's vitriolic flood of Noah. However, the American Indians somehow weren't affected. Neither were multiple sit civilizations with recorded history in the Middle East, including Egypt, Sumer, Babylon, and some various autonomous city-states. We may even have evidence that the Chinese went right through it 
while recording history. This doesn't work too well for Christians, so they focus on the how many animals could you fit in the ark theories fighting with Darwinian <clears throat> evolutionists. However, we only need to look at history to see that people survived this mythical flood and the DNA controversy over the Lamanites in the Book of Mormon who were formerly asserted to be the primary ancestors of the American Indians but seem to have disappeared in the Americas where the DNA results show 99.4% of the American tribes of the people tested wind up showing East Asian DNA. Mormon apologists try to say, well, they just disappeared. The Lamanites disappeared into this other population that was already here. Of course, that violates everything that the Book of Mormon says about cleansing the continent with the flood waters and then it becoming the promised land. It also violates everything in the Book of Moses saying the earth was baptized with water and everyone was killed except eight people along with the rest of the Bible narrative on that. So, the only way they disappeared into people, a large existing population, would be exactly to ha do as the anthropologist said, a large pre-existing population here, coming over from Asia somewhere after an ice age, long before Adam and Eve donned their first clothing and apparently not being washed away in the fairy tale we find in Genesis of Noah's flood. Well, how do we believe in a God that says, you know, he's truthful, honest, and cannot lie in the Book of Mormon, but lies constantly? Is this something we can really place our faith in? So you saw it on the Dodger Game channel. It's been a Mormon Truth video. Hope you like and subscribe and get into the channel. There's over 100 selections on all sorts of items having to do with the church's real history, changing doctrines, controversial and contradictory scriptures, and especially what goes on on LDS.org in the Gospel Topics essays, most especially, where the brethren are absolutely contradicting the scriptures, and I go right through it and show you where. See you in the comment section. Thanks.